Hello everybody, my name is Jean-Louis Dio, I'm a principal scientist at Kaizen Bioinformatics uh, located in Redwood City. And today I'm glad that I'm going to present to you a um, sample to inside biological exploration, as I say in my subtitle. And it's about the role of microRNA mRNA interaction in a specific uterine carcinoma called endometrioid, endometrial carcinoma. The story I'm going to present uh, came from that PLOS publications by uh, a Chinese group, and uh, they were looking at both microRNA and mRNA transcriptome to um, look at the potential role of these mi microRNA in stage one. EEC, I will use that acronym uh, for uh, convenience throughout the talk. So first of all, let me tell you what um, we have concluded um, using that sample to inside approach, uh, looking at microRNA, mRNA, and variant component of that story. We have found that one um, strong transcription factor called STDEF is an important, is likely uh, an important player in tumor production in EEC. Using the Kaizen bioinformatics solution, we were able to identify that SPDF was involved in cell migration and cell invasion. It acts as a tumor suppressor. However, we detected that a transcriptional program driven by that molecule seems to be inhibited, therefore allowing the cell invasion to progress. Second point, we found that near 266, uh, 1266 5P was able to target with high level of prediction SPDES for down regulation, and indeed, if you look at the transcriptomic data in patient 47, that molecule is downregulated. We have found also that SPDF is one of the downstream targets of a major network driven by endothelin 1, or EDN1, which is an important player in cancer progression. That network, called causal network, is involved in invasion of carcinoma cells, and I will demonstrate that later. And finally, we have also discovered that two variants, a missense that replace a G2C, were found in that particular molecule, last exon of SPDF, and that uh, variant was able to induce a likely loss of functions. So this is the outline of the presentation. I'm going to uh, give you a background on EEC and describe the study. I'm going to introduce to you to the notion of the sample to insight, Kaizen sample to insight, which is an extremely powerful approach to understand biology. We're going to explore the data analysis, uh, the expression level from the RNA-C data, and we're going to call a variant. And finally, we're going to bring uh, biological interpretations highlighted for the early stage of EEC, and it comes from three patients. We are going to look at the transcriptome, mRNA profile, look at the microRNA profile. We are going to identify microRNA mRNA network of importance in that EEC progression. We are going to identify and filter EEC causing variants. And we are going, finally, uh, the EEC causing variant with key microRNA mRNA network. and we are going to conclude. So the endometrium is the structure which is affected by that carcinoma. It's a glandular epithelial layer, consists of three important uh, layers, histological layers. Uh, the main infected is the spongiosum and the compactum stratum functionalis. That uh, tissue undergoes cellular and physiological uh, change uh, throughout the cycle and during embryo implantations. Uh, it uh, it uh, functions as um, a tissue modeling uh, like structures throughout the reproductive years. It's a process which is regulated by ovarian steroid uh, and many cytokines and growth factors. EEC, or endometrial carcinoma in general, is the most common gynecological malignancy in Europe and North America. So it's a very um, important public health issue. The most common type is called endometrioid, endometrial adenocarcinoma. This is the point of that study today. Many other types of endometrial carcinoma are named here. 
Specifically, the EEC is an estrogen dependent tumor. It's in general preceded by many biological processes coming from, uh, in, um, going from hyperplasia to a typical hyperplasia and so on. At um, diagnosis, 75% of the women have that disease confined to the uterus and it's called a stage one, it's the early phase. The five year survival for stage one patients is very good. It's from 80 to 90%. However, unfortunately, 10 to 20 will develop metastasis throughout their uh, disease. Most of these EEC are called low-grade tumor, named G1 or G2, and it means that the cells are moderately or well differentiated cells, still glandular cells. And this is early stage, means that the spread has not been beyond uh, the uterus. The risk factors are numerous. Uh, the main one on our menopause, but some cases are premenopausal. Obesity is starting to play an, an immense factor on that, and estimates that are 50% of these endometrial cancer in the US are attributable to excess adiposity, knowing that the obesity is going to increase and it's going to be a major issue for that type of cancer. Newly parity, diabetes, uh, and diabetes mellitus, as well as use of uh, contraceptive pills are among the other risk factors. The patients are generally treated with surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, or hormone therapy. So specifically that study, first of all, uh, the data has been uh, deposited in the NIH short read archive database under that uh, SRP number. Three uh, women have been diagnosed with stage one. Two were stage 1A and one was stage 1B, all were grade 1. We are going to find uh, throughout uh, the course of that webinar that uh, who are the two stage 1A and who is the stage 1B. In the paper, nothing has been described to indicate that. The sequencing has been under the mRNA as well as the small RNA level using Illumina high seq sequencing of the tumor and adjacent non-tumor tissue. The rich processing have um, looked for the mRNA, high quality mRNA sequencing reads uh, mapped to the uh, genome FG19 using Topat. And match uh, uh, reads are aligned to uh, the transcriptome ensemble GRCF37. Cufflinks have been used to calculate the mRNA expression level. For the small RNA sequencing reads, uh, they have been mapped to the genome using the BOTI software. Small RNA tags aligned to the microRNA precursor mature microRNA in MIRBES using the release 21 versions. Statistical tests have been used. For their microRNA target predictions, they use target scan, PETA, and Miranda. And finally, for looking at SMV and INDEL detections, they use VASCAN as well as ANOVA for uh, annotating them. ANOVA is uh, one of the products of the Kaizen bioinformatics suite right now. We are going to see that we are going to use different uh, strategy to uh, explore the biology of that uh, cancer in these three women. So what do we mean by the control uh, Kaizen sample to insight? Uh, first of all, this is really the first time for biologists, and I'm a biologist, I'm not a bioinformatician, that we can, from the sample isolation, extracting the RNA or the DNA through target enrichment, library construction, sequencing, we can analyze the data for looking at the um, variants and the mapping, and looking at the differential expressions. And finally, we can interpret that biology, looking, looking for causal variants, as well as affected pathways and many other things. And the good news is, Throughout the years, Kaizen has developed many useful kits that uh, are allowing us to uh, go through this structure. One in particular could have been used here, the gene read pure mRNA for um, having um, small mRNA, um, mRNA extraction that can be used in uh, NGS rounds. Uh, they have used iSeq sequencing here, and we are going to talk for the data analysis um, about that biomedical genomic workbench product as well as for the interpretation, and genetic variant analysis, and genetic pathway analysis. 
Here, this is a couple of icons to demonstrate what are the products from the kit to the software and to the value con interpretation here. So again, that sample to insight can be adapted to any type of exploration. Here we are going to look for these EEC tissues. We, uh, the tissue have been obtained after surgical resections. We extract uh, the total RNA. We could have used a carrying kit. Then we are going to send that to sequencing, the ISIC uh, illumina have been used, and we are going to process the data for that analysis using that biomedical uh, genomic workbench called BX here. And we are going to get the expression profile for the rna seq label, and we are going to call from the rna seq transcriptome the virus. And finally, we are going to <laughs> interpret the biology using uh, ingenuity pathway analysis as well as ingenuity virus analysis in an uh, interconnected way. So let me introduce to the biomedical uh, genomic workbench. It's for the data analysis processing. Uh, during that webinar, I'm not going to go in depth about this product because we have wonderful uh, webinars, and brochure, flyers, application notes, papers that describe in depth all of these uh, different solutions that we have, informatic solutions we have. But um, biomedical genomic workbench um, can um, deal with whole genome sequencing as well as whole exome sequencing, targeting or whole transcriptome sequencing. This is what we have to do today, as well as chip seq data. Um, the structure has been, uh, the uh, software has been uh, created um, or has created um, workflow that are ready to use uh, for single sample or cohort study. Uh, there is a um, simple uh, one-click analysis of gene rips being a second click on click on panels. But today we are going to use that streamlined integration with uh, ingenuity path analysis called IPA and ingenuity variant analysis. And we can also create our own workflow, which is uh, a very nice way uh, to be uh, to explore the biology of interest. This is what I've done today. So. If you use a uh, biomedical genomic workbench to IPA and you look at expression profile, you are going to go from the sequencing to the alignment, the quantitation, as well as the differential expressions. If you select the data, so I selected that Chinese data, uh, data. I have downloaded the FASTQ file from the SRF file. I have imported that FASTQ file into BX. Then I have set up the rna -seq analysis at the RNA level by selecting a reference genome, mapping options, and expression level. This is the result here. I have looked at the microRNA level using the MIRBES release 21 and doing the same. Then finally, I have set up an experiment at the transcript level. I could have done that at the gene level, and the experiment was tumor versus adjacent non-tumor. Then I filter on significant transcript and pull the data toward IPM for um, analysis. Same, we can call a variant from uh, that rna uh, file in rna coding protein. So the first uh, steps are identical as previously. We're going to select a workflow or a custom workflow uh, for calling the variant and the expression profile from the FASQ, we could have done that here using the identify variant and add expression value, but I selected to do a custom workflow from the read directly obtained from previously expression profile analysis. And this is the workflow that consists to look at uh, SNV in Dell, uh, eliminating force positive, force negative, and mapping that to the corresponding sequence gene and RNA level. And finally, we are going to send that to ingenuity variant analysis for analysis. Let me introduce to you also to Ingenuity Path Analysis, which is the most powerful tool today for biological interpretations. Uh, that all structure uh, of interpretation is based on a very powerful knowledge base called Ingenuity Knowledge Base, which is basically a database uh, in which a PhD student, a PhD scientist, um, have uh, curated um, thousands, thousands of findings 
uh, reading uh, peer review literature and have imported this in a very structured, what we call ontology, way and organized day in order for adjunctive variant analysis as well. IPA to be able to dig in that database, fetch the corresponding finding of interest that you can display to the eyes of the biologist. So it's a very powerful structure from which we can explore biology. From that, we can, for instance, look at gene view, can view or disease function view, which is basically knowing everything about a single gene or about a disease. Here, this is the case of caspases. We can know what are the pathways that caspase 8 belong to, what are the microRNA that target potentially that molecule, what it regulates, how is it regulated by, what it binds, what is the role in cells, and thousands of findings. Literally, you can have thousands of findings for one particular gene. Uh, we are very powerful now because we can look at human isoforms at the mouse and human level. This is an example, CASP8, uh, um, which is on the chromosome 2 locus, uh, have actually six uh, splicing variants when you look at the red stick mapping. We can look at canonical pathways use, um, and using molecule activity predictor. So what is a canonical pathway? Is basically a signaling cascade or metabolic cascade which uh, has a consensus throughout the scientific community and they are drawn by these PhD scientists that with peer review literature and are able to uh, uh, draw here that example of the uh, BMP or TGF beta signaling. The molecule activity predictor is another way to simulate the activity of some or that some molecule based on expression pattern or um, mimicking some effect of uh, a drug or a non-drug here. We have developed also a feature called Astrum Analysis, which is um, a feature that uh, answers a fundamental question in biology, uh, looking for potential driver, potential transcriptional driver of a particular program. And that, and I will show that to you later during the webinar, is uh, uh, exclusively used right now because we can determine if one particular molecule can be an astromodulator based on the pattern of expression of your gene in your data set. And we can indicate which direction that uh, regulator is activated or inhibited. And we have many other things that we can draw and connect these regulators together, either in a mechanistic way or causal way. I could uh, explain that later. We can also look at disease and functions, and we can determine, uh, based on what we call downstream effect analysis, based on the pattern of expression of your genes, we can determine if one particular biological processes or a set of processes can be increased or decreased. Cell movement seems to be increased, infectious disease seems to be decreased. We are using a color code to simplify the view. Finally, we can look at the regulator effects, which means time that transcriptional program I was talking about, through a layer of genes that belong to your data set with their relative expression. Here they all, all are all related, and you tie that to significant biological processes, function of the heart or contractility of the cardiac muscles. So it's basically the um, graal of uh, any biology, tying biological, proce uh, biological processes and a set of transcriptional factors that drive the expression pattern. We can look also at the microRNA target filter, which is a feature that allows us to associate microRNA to mRNA target uh, using different set of algorithms. We can also explore all the molecules, including drugs and chemicals, that uh, have been associated to particular diseases of interest. And looking at all the findings, the relative activity of that molecule and the impact of that molecule on the disease. But now, we can also look at what we call isoprofiler. In other words, looking at splicing variants or isoforms that have a function of interest in a particular disease or processes. And looking at their relative expression when you use, for instance, rna seq as we do in that webinar. We are going to find out which isoforms are key in one or two patients. Finally, we can uh, build network called interaction networks, we can use a set of uh, uh, features called build and overlay where you can construct everything you can imagine around uh, a set of centralized data. Um, here this is the expression pattern, you can look at uh, reagents, you can look at biomarker applications and many, many other goodies. And finally, 
even if the five million findings that we are constantly um, update QC for the 15 last years of ingenuity uh, uh, knowledge base uh, creation, uh, you can import your own findings in our knowledge base. Only you will be able to see these findings. But it is uh, excessively useful for uh, people that do not want to share but have specific property data they would like to insert in our uh, database. So the three patients are uh, early stage, uh, 2-1-A, 1-1-D, as I said, grade one. We are going to understand the transcriptome. And we are going to answer a couple of specific questions. We are going to look what are the signaling or metabolic pathways involved. And we are going to find out if they are activated or inhibited. And we are going to use the canonical pathway feature for that. We are going to look for the underlying transcription program using the upstream analysis. We are going to understand what biological processes are involved and in what way using the disease and functions. Finally, we are going to uh, look at um, splicing variants of interest and, and find out how they are regulated using ISO profilers. And this is also a very important uh, um, tool for biologists is to highlight hypotheses. And we can do that using the causal network in uh, particular web, uh, webinars. We are also uh, going to understand the micro microRNA profile, looking at mRNA target that, have, um, that uh, could be identified. And these targets uh, are um, the target of a differentially expressed microRNA in the cancer context. And we are going to draw microRNA and mRNA networks of importance that we think are important in that EEC tumor progression. So that slide. Uh, represent uh, um, the different canonical pathways, the signal in cascade. And here I'm showing uh, one of the patients called the patient P32. I'm going to call them P32, P46, P47. This is their age. So I'm calling them by their age. And if you look at that uh, slide, you are looking at multiple things. First of all, we are looking at uh, the presence of your gene uh, in your data sets that overlap with known uh, canonical pathways. For instance, there is a lot of genes in your data set that overlap with the EIF2 signaling pathways. It's here uh, the representation of the minus log p values. So, first of all, you look at the overlap of what are in your data set, what genes are present and which canonical pathway they overlap. And you can tell right away that uh, a lot of signaling metabolic pathways known are involved uh, in that tumor progression. Proliferations, ILK signaling, and taken signaling, and many others. But you notice also that we have a set of color orange, uh, shade of blue, and sometimes gray. And it's a way to determine what we call a pathway activity analysis that I mentioned here in the bottom. By doing that, we were able to determine uh, using a calculation uh, unit called the Z-score, uh, if one particular pathway is activated or if one particular pathway is inhibited. And it's very um, interesting to look at proliferation pathways such as EIF2 signaling is actually activated according to our, statis to our uh, statistical uh, algorithm. But if you look at ILK signaling and second signaling, which represent uh, the cell movement and the motility, uh, they are blue in indicating that according to our prediction, they seem to be inhibited. So here, looking at that canonical pathways feature, you right away uh, go into the subject and understand that for patient P32, there is proliferation, yet these canonical pathways that are associated, by the way, to the EMT, which is epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which is the starting point of detachment of cells that are going to start to migrate, are inhibited. So I was interesting of comparing these three patients, what I call P32, P46, and P47. So here, this is a representation of uh, what we call a heat map of these three patients and their uh, representative canonical pathways. A lot of these pathways are very well known, IL-6, ILK, Integrin, PPAR. When you do that, you realize that two of the patients, P32 
P32-P46 look alike. Their pattern look very much alike, indicating already uh, a potential um, uh, um, fact that uh, P32 and P46 may be the two stage 1A and P47 is the stage 1B. I was mentioning the uh, pathways. Proliferation is ongoing in all of these patients. Cell movement is on ongoing in a different way. Metabolic pathways are also noticeable. The TPAR, meaning as well, uh, gamma is involved too. So that comparison indicates us what are the pathways involved, what are their direction, and how they differ to each other between patients. Let's focus on what we call the metabolic pathways. And it's very interesting because for metabolic pathways, uh, in that particular case, we could not calculate the z-score, so it's uh, an enzymatic reaction, uh, so it's an equilibrium between two components. But we can definitely look at the overlap of uh, the genes in these uh, data sets that overlap with known pathways. And at the top, you realize oxidative phosphorylation is strong throughout this patient, and glycolysis is strong. And here on the left, I specifically look at the patient P32 per se. Right there, these indicate to me uh, the um, importance of what we call a Warburg effect. So because I do not know the direction of these pathways, are they activated or inhibited, we can uh, nevertheless uh, imagine that um, because we are in a tumor operation setting, the glycolysis uh, is heavily involved, and in fact, in the Warburg effect, tumor cells use aerobic glycolysis pathways um, a lot, contrary of normal cells. And oxidative phosphorylation, even though we have a strong overlap, that um, um, canonical uh, pathway is a um, uh, disadvantage of less use in uh, tumor populations. So, uh, that's just a, a way of getting a lot of biological absorption, just looking at overlap in specific metabolic way here for the three patients. Now I'm interesting to look at another patient for the, for the sake of the example and looking at a typical transcription program in early stage. Remember, these three patients are in early stage, two are one A, one is one B. That uh, slide represents um, the potential of some regulator with their level of activity, predicted here, activated. When you look at the target downstream and the relative expression pattern, we know that all these target downstream here in, in that first line are known to be downstream of nic one a Based on that, we're able to look, for instance, at NIC, FAT7, SPDF that we're going to talk about, and FAS are predicted to be activated. This is a reasonable um, prediction based on what we know of the tumor operation. These uh, transcriptional regulators are always set to be activated to start uh, the tumor, tumor regenesis process. But let's look at two other transcriptional uh, regulators called PPAR GC1A as well as PPAR GC1B. These are PPAR coactivator 1A and 1B. And if you use uh, that display network but on here, you are going to end up to that very nice figures. In the center, we have our uh, two. I added another one called SLDF2 uh, because it's important in what I'm going to say right now. These uh, three transcription uh, factors are predicted to be activated. And we know that because we know the pattern of expression of the genes that are here in that uh, outer circle and the relative expression. Based on their pattern of expression, we're able to determine that these guys are predicted to be activated. In other words, they have been turned on. And it's extremely important in that case, in the patient 46, because these guys drive uh, the fatty acid and the sterol metabolism pathways, which is a key, um, uh, which has a key role in the two proportion of any type of cancer. If you look at the uh, statistical uh, disease and function. You can add them. We have the capabilities to add them using uh, uh, raw features that we have in our uh, tools. If you do that and you use uh, the activity predictions, we are able to notice that proliferation of cells as well as inflammation of organ is set in orange, which means are uh, predicted to be increased. 
And here we look at the synthesis of steroid as well as glycolysis are or, um, as well orange in this activity. So the conclusion of that slide is indicating that. Based on the set of genes that are known to be downstream of these three transcription factors, we think that this transcription factor has been turned on, and they're able to drive the inflammation of organ up, and the proliferation of the cells up. So it's very good information as of now. We like to add also that each of these arrows are clickable and underlying there is findings and documentation throughout uh, the whole uh, knowledge base, and we can uh, even give you uh, the PML ID and get uh, the papers for reading if, uh, for, the, for the full extent of uh, information. Now, same as the clinical pathway, we like to compare these option analysis. In other words, we like to compare the transcription programs that are set in P32, P46, and P47. And I specifically ask the feature to look at growth factor and transcription regulators. And you can tell here that uh, right away the transcriptional program seems to define and distinguish the patient from each other. P32 and P46 look alike again, and the P47 is different. And I would like to concentrate on that molecule SPDF. And the same, I'm going to draw a network in the center of SPDF, which is predicted to be activated based on the pattern of expression of the genes that you see here. And that's very interesting because that molecule is involved in the cell migration and invasions. In P32 and P46, we think that SPDF is predicted to be activated. So when that molecule is activated, it indicates that the cell migration and invasion are actually inhibited in P32 and P46. If you look at patient 47, that molecule is inhibited, or predicted to be inhibited, that tells us that the cell migration and invasion is actually inducing P47. Slide after slide, it seems that P32 and P47 and, um, are in a stage 1A and P47 in stage 1B. So the stage 1A and stage 1B are different in the level of invasion of the myometrium. In other words, the cells that have been tumorous in the endometrium and start to move and start to migrate. And the first layer that are going to encounter is the myometrium. Stage 1B is invasions of the myometrium. Now I'm interested at what are the disease and functions using that dance from effect analysis to see what is important and what differs between these three patients. This is a heat map of these uh, this is in function based on their activation Z score. Those are inhibited, those are activated. And I will specifically look at one function of interest, obviously, which is the invasion of tumor. If you look at the invasion of tumor in patient 47 here, we uh, believe that invasion tumor is predicted to be activated. Again, this is based on the expression pattern of the genes that are known to be associated in downstream of that particular function. So it's very interesting to see that in P47, inversion of tumor is up. Let's look at a couple of uh, molecules here. Uh, I don't know if you can notice that on the slide, but the molecules are surrounded by the yellow halo. That indicates that you have specific isoforms that are differentially expressed. Let's look at antigen beta-1. We know that antigen beta-1 is a very important molecule in invasions of any type of uh, uh, cancer cells. And we know that molecule is involved in migration invasions uh, um, to other tissues. So if you look at the gene heat map, in other words, looking at the genes and the relative pattern of expression that are known to be associated to invasion of carcinoma cells for these three patients. Now we are looking at their real expression profiles. Green, down-regulated in a tumor versus non-tumor. Red, up-regulated in a tumor versus non-tumor. If you look at antiquin beta-1, that molecule here, or the molecule we have selected, is up-regulated in patient 47. So let's look at other isoforms. We realize here, 
that that particular isoform called ITGB1010 is upregulated in patient 47. Some others are, but they have not been selected by the staff. If you look at the patient 42, uh, 32 and 46, you realize that many of their splicing variants are actually downregulated. So what does it tell us? It tells us that one particular isoform has an important role in the region of carcinoma cells. We probably need to explore that. This is why I said nephromot. We are not sure we are going to have an hypothesis to test here. Integrating beta 1, isoform O10 may be involved in that invasion process. It's a key function. Now I'm interested at in looking at what we call a causal network. So what is a causal network briefly? It's a network based on a master regulator and a set of regulators that all together in a very causal way because they are associated to each other only by activation and inhibition edges, they are able and responsible to explain plausibly the expression pattern of here 352 targets downstream none of these particular regulators. Second point, what we call a causal network allow us to sometimes find intermediate between that master regulator and down, target downstream here. In other words, EDN1 may not have been known to be connecting with SPDF, but with the help of other regulators, we may find a connection. So that's a very interesting and a novelty that you can explore too. And third important point is we can tie that causal network to bicycle processes of the disease of interest throughout the beginning, since the beginning of that webinar, I'm very interested in invasion of carcinoma cells because this is a, a, a process that differentiates the patient 47 from the patient 32 and 46. And I ask the question, what are the intermediates that you can insert between EDN1, that master regulator, and the invasion of carcinoma? And the software is able to find through our gigantic source, our gigantic database, that integrating, integrating beta 1, as well as alpha 2, PLUR, and EDN3 are the intermediate, potential intermediate between EDN1 and invasion of carcinoma cells. Why is it important? It's because now we have a network of regulators that are associated to downstream target that are plausibly um, allow us to explain when invasion of carcinoma is increased. This is the case here, it's orange. Endotelin 1 is a central player in tumor operations. And here this is from a review uh, uh, published in Fazem in 2011. And that molecule is involved in many tissues, and it certainly has been described many times in cancer for the proliferation, cell survival, metastasis, and you name it. So, that network was uh, extremely important to um, be highlighted here. This is a, a network that needs to be tested, needs to be validated in the lab uh, for confirmation. This is certainly a very strong hypothesis to understand why uh, we have an increase of cellular invasion in patient 47. If you look in the uh, network present here, I have um, surrounded by um, uh, that circle, another molecule as well as PDF that I talked since the beginning. That molecule is the VCAN, and she has a yellow halo. And now using the ISO profiler, which is the latest feature we have released, that will help me to discover what are the isoforms that may drive the tumor progressions, because we have findings that are associated to that particular isoforms. And here, if you look at the comparison between P32, P46, and P47, P32 being here, 46 being in that colon, and P47 in that colon, we are able to look at which isoforms of VCAN seems to be differentially expressed and have an important biological role in P47. And the case is there. I hope you can see that in P32, that isoform is down-regulated. We don't know what the uh, um, 
expression is for P46, but uh, I uh, check in the borderline uh, below significance, but it's up regulated in the P47. So using that ISO profiler, I was able to dig through all the different isoforms that are present in my data set with their relative expression and find out the goal of that particular molecule. I pointed on that VCAN because that VCAN has been involved in malignant solid tumor being described in breast cancer. So it's certainly again an exploration of the role of the VCAN O1 that could be done now in the lab because it differentiates patient 47 from the two other patients. Let's go back to that uh, causal network driven by endothelin 1. Uh, we know that uh, molecules, mRNA, are under regulation, uh, microRNA regulations. In that other set, uh, the team had studied the microRNA profile, and we have done the same. And here, I have asked the questions, show me from the significant, with the function of 1.5 and the p-value over 5, what are the microRNAs that target endothelin 1? And it's represented here with their relative expressions. For instance, near 3131 is upregulated in tumor. Let 7A5P is down regulated in tumor. And we overlay the color cause. Here we really believe, based on the prediction of uh, endothelin 1 being increased, uh, that uh, let 7A is down regulated in the data set. And therefore, we have a strong um, tie here. We are not certain that 31. 31 is able to downregulate it because if it was the case, that microRNA should be downregulated. This is not the case. So, the summary of that slide is yes, we have microRNA that targets many molecules. I selected EDN1. And now we are able to understand the role of these microRNA in tumorogenic processes. At the beginning, I told you about the tool called Molecule Activity Predictors, and it's basically a simulator, like a flight simulator. And I asked the question here. If I was adding let 7 a 5 p as well as near 1, 3 p what would be the activity on the dotilin 1 and the intermediate as well on the invasion of carcinoma? If you add that, which is represented by that red paint, you are going to turn that EDN1 from orange to blue, which indicates that EDN1 will be predicted to be inhibited. And you can see the major impact of this microRNA on the invasion of carcinoma cells. It turned blue, if I may say, which indicates that invasion of carcinoma cells will be decreased. So, the addition of this specific microRNA may help in relieving that invasion of carcinoma and reducing it. It's very interesting because the delivery of microRNA as therapeutic against cancer is now in development. So it's certainly another idea to test in the lab. But we had uh, something like 106 microRNA that were uh, significant in your data set. Uh, if you do that and you use the microRNA target filter that allows to associate these microRNA with a mRNA target based on their seed sequence, we realize that over 15,000 mRNA are potentially targetable. This is not actionable in the lab. So we are going now to use different strategies to filter in a selective way uh, the mRNA targets of interest. First point is you associate these microRNA to a specific data set. Obviously, I was interested in the patient 47, which is, to my guess, the only one the patients, the one uh, in which his cells are starting to migrate, her cells are starting to migrate to the myometrium. So let's uh, understand what is the uh, cellular invasion is, is affecting. By doing that, you realize that you reduce the number of mRNA targets from 15,000 to 1,800. It's a little bit more interesting. However, still a large number. So let's now use a set of filters here. You can filter by the confidence level between the micro and mRNA. I selected the eye prediction. I didn't want to look at the experimental observed. I wanted to look at what are the high potential using target scan as an algorithm to define if a particular microRNA that you see here 
and the particular RNA uh, can interact. I selected also uh, in the context of tumor morphology. It's very interesting uh, to understand uh, that microRNA in a context in a specific uh, biological processes. And I have selected only as target transcription regulator here. By doing that, you obtain only a minimal set of 12 microRNA that are differentially expressed that target only 16 mRNA. This is much more actionable and interesting for validation in the lab. Here, this is a represent of 9 of these 12 microRNA and 12 of these 16 mRNA that are uh, involved in uh, this patient 47. So I just put that network in. You recognize SPDF, which is done regulated in the patient 47 tumor, and you look at these specific microRNA that are up regulated. I focus only on translation regulators that are negatively regulated for uh, the purpose of that talk. If you associate a particular disease that are significant, statistically significant, realize that the proliferation of cancers seems to be increased. It's orange, seems to be increased. So that little network here is able to drive the proliferation of cancers up. So many of these microRNA and RNA may be very important players. So, so far, what did we achieve using that sample to inside approach looking at microRNA and mRNA only? Uh, we know that if, uh, SPDF is involved in cell migration, cell invasions, the contribution program driven by that molecule is inhibited. Therefore, allowing the cell invasion to progress, in particular in the P47 patients, we know uh, what type of microRNA is predicting to target SPF, the program regulations, and we have found out that that molecule is involved in a uh, network uh, extremely important for invasion of carcinoma cells. But I'm interested also in, in looking at potential EEC causing variant, and we have done the processing of calling the variant from a, that RNA-sync uh, profile. And for that, we are using a a tool, uh, a software uh, solution called Ingenuity Variant Analysis. It's in fact a software that uh, uses intuitive filters to zero in on causal variants. And I'm going to show that to you. That software helps you also to tie a particular variant to a particular phenotype. Here I represent obviously the SPDF I was talking about with the blue color I'm going to explain later. And that molecule, that variant is associated to endometrial cancer through a set of different intermediates. So it's very, very powerful. So how did I do here? I selected the patient 47. For that patient 47, between the tumor and adjacent non-tumor, we are over 500,000 variants. And we are going to reduce using genetic and structural filters, basically, to a set of 2,000 cancer driver variants that I'm going to use uh, to uh, connect to uh, IPM. First of all, I remove the poor quality variant and usual suspect, and we do that using the confidence filter, which is indicated here. Again, I'm not going to go in detail because we have powerful webinars that educate and train us, all of us, about the function and the features of all these uh, uh, powerful uh, solutions that we have. So I strongly recommend that uh, we go to kaizenbioinformatics.com and uh, you can look at all these webinars, flyers, and many other goodies here. I also removed the variants found in healthy population, obviously interesting only in the um, uh, patient uh, populations. And I use for that the common variant. In particular, I was able to remove a variant that are present in what we call the allowance frequency community. It's a very strong uh, database that has compiled over 120,000 genomes, and you can imagine using a filter to that database, you are going to exclude a lot of false positives. So it's a very powerful and growing database here that we have. Uh, uh, I also uh, look for the pathogenicity or the gain or loss of function of the particular variant I have filter, and I uh, do that using what we call a predicted deleterious variant. We can look at pathogenic, likely pathogenic. You can look at every variant that has been associated with the gain of function or loss of function using these different parameters here. 
Finally, I could compare the variant found in my case versus my control, in my tumor versus my adjacent non-tumor, and I use what we call a genetic analysis filter. And I have used a preset looking for tumor-specific variants that are present in my uh, tumor tissues and exclude them in the non-tumor uh, uh, tissues using that filter here. And finally, I try to uh, have that idea of the class to phenotype to identify biologically relevant variants in my patient 47 that can be tied to endometrial carcinoma. So I use the cancer driver variant. This is not per se biological feature, but this is a preset uh, system that allows us to look at cancer associated mouse knockout phenotype as well as associated cellular processes and many other things, including the CCJ uh, database. For that particular purpose, Today, I didn't use biological, pharmacogenomics, and other statistical filters here. But doing that, I was able to have uh, over 2,000 variants. And I'm going to use this list of 2,000 cancer driver variants to uh, interact now uh, uh, with uh, IPA. So I was uh, interested in SPDF, and I was wondering if SPDF has a, a type of variant. And the answer is, oh, sorry. I was interested in looking at that uh, SPDF uh, contained variant, and I have uh, connected that variant analysis uh, filtering system to IPA to pair the variant information with the transcriptome. In fact, I have imported interactivity of the variant, gain or loss of function, as well as their American College Medical of Gen Genetics and Genomic Classification, extremely important. And I have rerun the analysis and look at this famous absent regulator. You, we have inserted now a new column called the variant gain loss of function. I've selected those that are loss, uh, those that have a loss or likely loss of function. I could have selected their variant based on their SCMG classification. I didn't here. And very interesting enough, I found back my molecule of interest, SPDF. It's relative down regulation here in the tumor versus non tumor in patient 47. And I noticed also that SPDF seems to have uh, um, likely loss of function. It's indicated by the minus one. Uh, it doesn't matter number. We know we have a loss of function of interest here. It's a transcription relator. The z-score which predicts the type of activity is low here, but knowing all parts and all elements that I've gathered since the beginning of that webinar relative to that particular molecule and its function, uh, its role, we are able to find out that SPDF is extremely important now for the patient 47. And we know that we have found variant that affects its function. Let's go back to variant analysis to describe these variants. Here we have a table. We know the type of uh, transcript variant, type of protein variant, the type of translation impact, uh, the region in which that variant uh, is um, affecting, and uh, based on the SIFT and polyphen, which are going to predict the damaging effect on the function of the affection is indicated. We have a couple of other uh, elements here, uh, the genotype, uh, the type of component of the number of copies, and so on. But to visualize, this is the variant. This is based on the ensemble mapping. That molecule is on the chromosome 6, and you realize that the variant is in the last exon here affecting the ETS binding site, extremely important. And here we have uh, um, display also the type of um, expression profile. That molecule in patient 47 is downregulated in the tumor. So it's downregulated and add variant that induce a likely loss of function of that particular um, gene. So now if you go back to the microRNA and RNA uh, network that I have drawn a couple of slides earlier, you can highlight which of these molecules I will likely lose, and I saw only in green SPDF. So now, what are the conclusions we can get? If you look at that sample to inside approach, looking now at the three components I've used, the microRNA, the mRNA, and the variant. We know that molecule is done regulated in P47, and we have used a biomedical genomic workbench looking at differential expression of genes to find that. We have looked at the transcriptional program driven by SPDF, and we know it's predicted to be inhibited based on the expression pattern of its mRNA target, and we have used the upstream analysis in IPA 
and uh, we could do that um, using a negative, um, an indication of the negative disco. We know that SPDF is involved in cell migration invasion and split is inhibited in patient 47, and we have used the feature downstream effect analysis in ITM. We have also found out that SPDF is a downstream target of a network driven by endothelin 1. That network is involved in invasion of calcium cells. We could find out using causal network analysis. Uh, the causal network analysis was um, having a positive discord. Um, could have, um, and it can have the, the activity of that particular network. We also find out which microRNA can target SPDF for inhibitions, and we have uh, using that microRNA target filter features, which is extremely important to draw an idea uh, uh, of the microRNA mRNA interactions. We have drawn that microRNA mRNA network, and we know it's involved in cell invasion and proliferation of cells. And finally, we have found two variants, MISFENS, replace a G2C. It's found in that the last exome that affects the ETF domain in SPDF. And these variants induce a likely loss of function. And we have found that using the NGMT variant analyzing software. So, and I'm, I'm very pleased because as a biologist using bioinformatic approach, and I'm not a bioinformatician, using the biomedical genomic workbench, I could do by my own the upload of the rna data aligned to the genome of interest. I use ensemble, I could have used RevSeq. I could quantitate, obtain differential expression between the sample. I could call a variant. I could send the data directly to IPA as well as to NGMT variant analysis for um, variant identification, prioritization, and biological interpretations. Using IPA, I was able to visualize the differential expression genes in a tumor versus adjacent non-tumor in these three patients. I could understand which signaling pathways are involved in the tumor progression. I could discover the potential transfer that are induced or repress that may drive that tumor progression. I was able to differentially uh, to visualize the differentially expressed splashing variants and their role. I could discover biological processes that participate in the tumor progression. And very importantly, I was able to highlight new hypotheses that obviously needs to be tested and validated, and this hypothesis could explain invasiveness in particular. And using an NGMT variant analysis, I was able to filter and identify EC causing variants. I was able to tie these variants to the micro RNA network of importance that I drew earlier. And finally, I could obtain data on their infer activity and their potential pathogenicity uh, using uh, SEMG. So it's a very powerful bioinformatic approach that is um, a, an important uh, solution for biology, uh, biologists like me. And I was very glad to present that webinar. And now I'm open to questions. Thank you.